seven, six, five. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justine, and thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the Starboard Portal and the US Sailing Team Live featured presentation with IRD analyst Riley Shutt. Thanks, Riley, for joining us. Um, if Riley Shutt has been a, the US Sailing Team as our, our IRD performance analyst since 2017, after graduating from MIT with a degree in aerospace engineering, he has focused his career on the fluid dynamics of racing sailboats. Riley has been a member of the design teams for the Volvo Ocean Race, Bendy Globe, America's Cup, and many one-off record-breaking boat designs, including the 2013 America's Cup, where Riley was head of the hydrodynamics CFD for Artemis Racing in the redesign of their hydrofoiling catamaran. Riley started his research at the Cornell University before joining the U.S sailing team during his PhD studies. This research is being continued at the university by fellow colleagues, one of which is listening in today. Hey, Sarah, and um, Professor Charlie Williamson is also with us. So welcome to both of you. Um, their research looks at the unsteady aerodynamics around Olympic sailboats and sails, which Riley will be sharing with us today in his presentation titled Vortex Aerodynamics in Olympic Sailing. And now our IR&D performance analyst, Riley Shutt. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Justine. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I'm excited to uh, yeah, talk today about vortex aerodynamics and some kinetic techniques. So as Justine said, I'm the performance analyst for the IR&D group at the US sailing team. And I'm going to talk today about yeah, research that we did at Cornell University that they're continuing now. So a little bit. Just an overview of today's talk. Our goal is to answer the question, why do kinetic sailing techniques work? And what are the aerodynamic reasons? So break down into just four pieces, some background and context, what our experimental setup on the water looks like, then dive into two techniques, downwind S-turns and roll tacking. It's a little overview of what the sailing research project at Cornell is. It happens in the Fluid Dynamics Research Laboratories with Professor Chaz Williamson, who I think is listening today. Um, and the goal is to define dynamic sail motions as used by Olympic level sailors. We'll obtain characteristic motion profiles by running on the water experiments, and then explain how these unsteady sail techniques generate extra propulsion for the boat. Finally, from an aerodynamic point of view, we wanna link the unsteady forces to the vortex structures that are shed by the sail, and we do that through laboratory experiments. So over on the right here, we see Philippe and Robbie doing some on the water sailing for us. And then Sarah is working on our towing tank, uh, setting up the lasers in the bottom right. So just to take a step back here, we're talking about Olympic racing. So this is yeah, fixed courses, primarily upwind and downwind and the occasional reaching leg. Uh, and importantly, small lightweight boats where you can get significant dynamic motion due to the sailors moving their body weight around. And of course, as it always is, this is governed by world sailing and the racing rules of sailing, which we'll get into a little bit because kinetic techniques, we know that they're limited. So if we look at aerodynamics research that's been done before, um, there's a bunch on this page, but I think the takeaway is that very little of this is focused on the dynamics of small boats. So we've got a bunch of large yacht racing research that's been done. That's where you've got design teams that have bigger budgets. They can put money into R&D, do aerodynamic studies. Uh, we've got a few really good sailing books uh, that I definitely recommend reading some of by Mark High and Beth Waite. Um, but in those, there's only a couple pages here and there that are dedicated to kinetic techniques. They have a lot of really good information, but Beth Waite has a small chapter on kinetic techniques and Mark High touches on it a few times. So, we can look at some more classic studies uh, in aerodynamics, which there was a lot of really good research that happened just on pitching and heaving airfoils and starting in the 20s and 30s. But the really interesting one to compare to is biomimetics. So this is where aerodynamicists look at what bird flight, insect flight, how those work, and then try and bring that into the lab. 
And so we're calling our research sport memetics, where we look at what, rather than evolution in biomimetics, what sailors have developed techniques that work through racing and winning races. So we take that, look at the motions, look at the aerodynamics, and come up with an academic explanation. So just to take a step back, look at the aerodynamic context that we see on the boat. So of course, the wind that's felt on the boat is the apparent wind. This is a combination of the true wind vector, the boat speed, that gives us the apparent wind, which is, yeah, that's the incoming flow onto the boat. It happens at the apparent wind angle. And the boat is moving at an angle relative to the true wind. And of course, the performance that we're trying to improve by doing these kinetic techniques is increasing your VMG. So making your progress in the direction of the wind more or your progress downwind better. And now here's the elephant in the room. Kinetic, kinetic techniques are limited by rule 42, which says the crew shall not move their bodies to propel the boat. This prohibits things like rocking, pumping, flicking, repeated actions if there's not a tactical reason for them in the race, or excessive maneuvering. You can't just go and roll tack your way all the way up the deep. But rule 42 is pretty long. There's a bunch of sections and there's exceptions in there. So except when permitted. Uh, class rules also allow rule 42 violations, if you will. Um, the windsurfers don't have a lot of parts of rule 42. The fin and the 470, they take off restrictions after a certain wind range. And you're also allowed to move your body weight, move the boat around during maneuvers. So if you have to tack anyway, you might as well do it in a beneficial way. And also in response to changing conditions. So wind gusts, waves, you can readjust the boat and that's when you can really employ these kinetic techniques to make it work. And I think the really important takeaway from this is the bold line at the bottom. The need for rule 42 shows that these techniques work, uh, but an understanding of how they work hasn't been published with real experiments. So that's where we come in. We're not trying to judge what should be illegal or what shouldn't be, but looking for the aerodynamic mechanism of why these kinetic techniques make you go faster. So what kinds of legal motions are we talking about? We've got roll tacking, sail flicking, downwind S turns or S curves, body pumping. And here we've got a video of Stu and Dave, our 470 sailors. Dave's working really hard there, flicking the sail, uh, pumping his body, and you can see them lifting off of their training partner. So it's working. Yeah, so our experimental approach at Cornell we start off running on the water experiments with data acquisition, where we set up and collect the data from the boats with real sailing conditions. Then we bring that data into the lab and analyze it to define characteristic motion profiles. From those motion profiles, we then run laboratory tank experiments, where we use particle image velocimetry and force measurements to really analyze what's happening in the fluid around the sails when you do these techniques. So we're on the water setup. We used a standard rig laser as our test platform. Now, this has been the Olympic boat since 1996, and we're pretty confident that it'll be there at least through 2024 and probably beyond. It's an incredibly popular boat uh, with more than 200,000 produced. And we did our testing both on Cuga Lake uh, near Cornell and down at the U.S. Sailing Center in Miami, Florida. So we had some really good sailors willing to help us, help us out. Uh, Sarah Lehan, who was on the Olympic team in 2012. Phil Alley, who was the captain of the Cornell sailing team and one of the top 10 collegiate sailors. And then Robbie Gilmore, who's an Irish sailor uh, and got sixth in the radio worlds, was overworking with us for a summer. So the instrumentation that we have on the boat. The, one of the primary tools that we use is a MEMS inertial measurement unit. So basically, we took the guts of an aircraft UAV autopilot, uh, altered the hardware a little bit, changed the software. Uh, this gives us the rigid body motion and orientation of the boat. So primarily heel, pitch, yaw, but also from the GPS, we get location, speed, and direction. And we get our orientations 50 times a second and our location and speed 
10 times a second. And this was done some great work uh, with Colin Kyle, who is now doing his PhD at Northeastern in robotics. So we took our masthead fly and added a logging anemometer. Uh, this gives us the ability to read our apparent wind speed on the boat. At, so we get a pre precision of a tenth of a meter per second. It gives us some magnetic an angle information that isn't always that useful. But importantly, it logs this every other second and we can record a full testing session for two hours. And of course, we've got an array of GoPro cameras on the boat to optically track things. I mean, these are great, as I'm sure you all know, because they're relatively inexpensive compared to other lab equipment. Uh, waterproof, they've got a good mounting system. The challenges using them are you've got a lot of lens distortion, and you also have to sync the data with all of your other instruments. And as you can see here, we added a bunch of draft stripes to our sail. Uh, so it's pretty important to use a similar sail material to what your sail is made out of. So we put five background stripes, uh, high contrast. And as you can see in the background, we added extra dots when we needed them for some other investigations. So in our uh, investigations here, we're focusing on draft stripe number two. In these kinetic techniques, this is the the most active part of the sail. It's about two thirds of the way up the sail. And rather than looking at the full 3D picture, at, which is pretty complex, we're looking for the fundamental mechanisms that are happening in the aerodynamics of the sail. So we're gonna do a 2D analysis and we've isolated this second draft stripe here as the area where we're gonna run that 2D analysis around. So through all of our experiments on the water, we're focusing on what's happening at that second draft stripe and then we'll bring that into the lab. When we look at that second draft stripe, we're using OpenCV, which is an open source computer vision library. And we use that to extract geometric and numerical data from the video footage. And so we do that from the masthead camera and then a camera mounted in the middle of the boom. So like I said, there's a lot of distortion with your GoPro camera. So we use OpenCV first to remove the distortion. You see going back and forth here that makes it so it looks like reality. And then we can isolate that draft stripe and track it after we've recorded the data from the water. So here we're looking at, these are some sail flicks and OpenCV tracks those four sail flicks. We can also do the same or a similar thing with the bow camera. So here we've identified some features on the horizon, and then we track the angle of those features as this is Phil Alley sailing the boat here in Miami. And that gives us a live view of what's happening in heel. So now if we, that was our on the water setup. Now we'll look at, yeah, how we use that for downwind S turns. Uh, so one thing with our background image here, this is from a downwind S-turn testing day on Cuga Lake. And you can actually see Cornell up on top of the hill here in the background. And our lab is on the first floor of this building right here. So S-turns, what are we talking about? So this is a downwind sailing technique where you cyclically steer and rock the boat. And so if we look at our second draft stripe, it's taking this S-shaped curve through the air and so is the boat, uh, a smaller S shape through the water. So the important part here is that the true wind direction is the same direction as our average boat heading. And because the laser doesn't go faster than the wind when you're going dead downwind, this is primarily a drag based propulsion. So if we want to increase our driving force for going downwind, we essentially need to increase the effective drag on the sail. And so I was looking through uh, the videos that US Sailing has posted on YouTube, and I saw this promo video of Paige Raley, our radial sailor, uh, sailing, getting ready for the Rio Olympics. And here we can see her do a nice S turn in sync with the waves. So what does our testing on Cuga Lake look like? This is the GPS track from a testing section where the Ithaca Yacht Club was nice enough to let us use their facilities to run our testing out of. 
and we had Robbie go sale, do some upwind tax, and then do these big long downwinds where it was full of S turns between here from A to A, and then do another upwind section and go all the way down the lake, uh, going downwind, collecting some really good testing data. And so again, here's a video uh, of a few S turns from that testing session. And we see Robbie here, he's coordinating his steering, the rocking of the boat, getting that sail to make that S turning motion through the air. And so this video clip, we've got a couple of S turns happening here. And we're gonna look at this time section of data from a few of our different uh, on the water data sources. So first our video analysis, so our bow camera, you can see here, it's that same clip of the S turn where we're removing the distortion. So on the left-hand side, you can see the horizon is pretty curved. And then when we remove the distortion, you get a straight horizon. And that lets us identify the horizon and track the heel angle, which we're doing it in a slightly different method than the previous video, uh, where here we're identifying candidate straight lines on the horizon, identifying which one is really the horizon and then tracking that. You can also see that we've got our IMU mounted at the mast step here. So this is what's recording our rigid body motion, our heel, our pitch, our yaw of the boat. And so we're recording heel information twice. So I think in scientific studies, it's always a really good idea to know what your measurement error is. You're never gonna be able to measure exactly what's happening. There's always gonna be some error in your measurements. And one good way to quantify what that error is is to try and measure the same thing in two different ways. So here we do that both optically with our camera and then also with our IMU. And this plot overlays those two data sources. And you can see that by and large, they're quite close to each other. Um, and so this gave us confidence that the data that we were looking at is pretty good. And it also let us primarily use the IMU for heal data because it's a lot easier to get the data from the IMU than to process all the video frames. Can also do things like, so this is a picture from the bow camera where we look at that masthead fly and check its angle, which then that gives us what the instantaneous apparent wind at the top of the mast is at any point in time. So by far the most useful uh, camera view turned out to be for this S-turn study was the masthead video. This lets us track things like rudder angle, boom angle, sail shape, mass bending. If we look at again, that same uh, S-turn here, we can see really clearly Robbie's coordinating his sail trim, his helming and the rocking of the boat. So again, here, these are the draft stripe number two, which is the one that we're interested in. The boom angle, sail sheeting angle, rudder angle, we can track that black tiller against the white deck. So again, if we go back to our S turn, we've taken all the data and we look at that characteristic motion and identify four key times. So one where we've got the maximum by the lee heading where maximally our V roll, which is our healing velocity, how quickly you're healing over. Um, then you get to a point where you're dead downwind, you come back. So key point three is where your maximum reaching heading or you're as high as you are and then go back to dead downwind and the cycle repeats itself. So if we take all of our collected on the water data and turn it into your average S turn, what does that look like? This is an animation of actual data that we collected on the water. Uh, what normally is your wind triangle turns into a wind quadrilateral because you have this rolling motion of the boat. We'll just watch that again. You've got this black draft stripe number two is highlighted in the image. And you've got the S curve of the sail and the S curve of the boat. So if we look again at our four key times, you can see the apparent wind angle relative to that draft stripe number two swings back and forth a lot. So we go from that quite by the lee angle from key time number one and then a pretty reasonable reaching angle at key time number three, where two and four, the wind is coming from a stern 
and you're getting pushed downwind by drag. So now this is an important plot. It's, there's a lot going on here, uh, but this is a modified polar diagram. So it's a little different than polar diagrams that we usually look at, but here this is downwind sailing. So we want our boat speed, which turns into VMG to be as low as possible on the page. And the important takeaway here is the steady sailing estimate, which we got from looking at times during our testing where Robbie wasn't doing S turns. That's up here. And then during our S turn cycle, the VMG and the boat speed is a lot higher. So we see that during these S turns, Robbie's almost a knot faster in VMG uh, going downwind. So it really is not that surprising, uh, but he's improving his performance a lot. Um, so now we've collected these on the water characteristic motions, and we want to see exactly what's happening around the sail that's giving that big increase in performance. So we're going to bring these motions into the lab and we're going to use an XY computer controlled towing tank, so XYTT testing. Um, and we do that, again, we're identifying draft stripe number two. We're turning that into a 2D section. We can then 3D print these extrusions and use those as our test samples in the towing tank. So in the towing tank, we're using water as the fluid. Uh, but as long as we keep our non-dimensional numbers, so Struhall number is the important one here, the same, we can use water instead of air. And then it's a lot easier to measure forces, the flow visualization, and this particle image volume symmetry, which we'll talk about in a second, is also a lot easier to do in water. So we chose that as our testing uh, media. So what does our towing tank look like? It's a five meter towing tank. Again, we've got this carriage that moves up and down the tank. Uh, and that's computer controlled so we can program in our characteristic motion. Uh, a lot of the work setting up this tank was done by Jenny Borshock and Colin Kyle. So big thanks to them for doing that and uh, yeah, working with us for a long time. Um, so our characteristic motion profile that we got from our on the water testing is shown down here at the bottom. So this is the way that our 2D sail section moves through the tank. And that generates an apparent wind relative to the sail uh, with these arrows and the sail motion is from left to right. So this is a video of our actual uh, towing tank in action. You can see me setting up stuff on the computer in the background. We go, it lowers the sail section into the water, uh, runs, in this case, it's a sail flicking test, goes through the water, now you'll see it comes back and it's gonna run the same test again, but in the air. And that's so that we can measure just the inertial forces on our 2D sail, as opposed to when it's in the water, it's the inertial plus the fluid forces. And that allows us to identify the fluid forces. And then we let it repeat uh, and it can run a bunch of tests. Um, in fact, we ran 18,000 towing tank tests uh, for these investigations, which is the equivalent of letting the tank run for 125 24 hour days. Uh, so, Teo Maynard did a lot of uh, the testing work with us. So, big thanks to him also. So, okay, so one other thing that we did with these towing tank tests is run some NACA 0012 tests also, which is that you can see a little picture of a 0012 up in the top right here. And that's basically your classic symmetric airfoil. And the reason that we wanted to do these tests was when you're doing these kinds of things, it's really important to compare your results to results from the literature so that you know that your results are valid. You got the same answers that people have gotten before. So then when you extend your experiments, you can say, okay, we matched them on the 0012. So we're pretty confident the forces that we're collecting on our sales section are also valid. So here we're comparing to two tests. Uh, Cleaver et al. did some experiments at low angles of attack here, uh, and we matched them quite well. And then Sheldahl and Klimas did some numerical work, so that's computer simulations of the rest of the angles of attack. And we matched them quite well also, which is uh, impressive because here we're comparing our experimental approach 
with their numerical approach. Uh, if we look at, so that was the lift curve. This is the drag curve from the 0012. And again, we matched them uh, quite well. So this is the same drag curve, but for our 2D sail section, matching that second draft stripe uh, rather than the 0012. And if we flip back, we see that we've got a maximum drag on the 0012 around 1.7. And then the 2D sail section, we're up closer to 1.9 or 2. So our 2D sales section is giving us more drag, which again, drag is what's propelling us downwind. So in this case, that's good than the 0012 section. All right, so now we're gonna talk about particle image velocimetry, which I've mentioned a couple of times. And so this is actually a picture of our towing tank. And what we've done is put lots of tiny little glass beads into the towing tank and then shine a laser through the tank, but that laser is spread through a lens. So it's just a one millimeter thick sheet of a laser. And so it's illuminating all these tiny little particles. So basically we've got, here's a video from La Vision showing the laser shines through, looks at the fluid flow that's happening. Then the computer does a correlation between subsequent pictures and recreates the flow field uh, so that this allows us to get a picture of how the flow is happening in the whole tank uh, or everywhere that the camera sees. So, and gives us yeah, a numerical flow field uh, when we run the experiments. And so from that, we can generate images like this. So this is steady downwind sailing of our section where we can see the streamlines. Again, we can capture these from that PIV technique. We can see that in reaching dead downwind and by the least sailing, all these where the person is just sailing in a straight line or here our test specimen is in a straight line, you get these big separated regions behind the sail. And then we've got blue and red vorticity. This is where there's rotation in the flow, uh, but only at the border of this separated region. So, we did a combination of 22 different PIV experiments where we've got, you can see our sail section here. And this is looking at just the raw PIV images, which I think are kind of mesmerizing just to watch. Um, so here we've got our S turn happening. Our sail section is doing our characteristic motion profile. And you can see these big vortices of particles uh, being generated every time that the sail changes direction. So then we run those raw images through our PIV correlation software. And this is what that same motion looks like, but now where the computer is telling us how much vorticity there is. And we see these large red and blue vortexes uh, being generated as the sail changes direction and then being shed where the vortex departs from near the sail. So we have that PIV. We were also measuring forces on our sail section. Uh, so measuring what the force or the force coefficients should be on that second draft strike during our experiments. And here we've got downwind force. So the force driving the boat downwind. Um, and again, remember our drag on the sail was about 1.9. So our downwind force coefficient is about the same for steady sailing. That's this dotted line here at the bottom. And the takeaway here is that our experimental average from our S turn is quite a bit higher. So we see that this motion profile does give us a downwind force that's enhanced, which makes sense because we saw that Robbie was going faster in that polar diagram. The other interesting part here is this dotted line here, which is labeled quasi steady. So the quasi steady line is if you just took your lift and drag polars for that sail section and said, okay, now we're at this angle, what should our forces be? We see that that overlaps pretty well for a lot of our uh, motion, but between key times four and key time one, we get a pretty big departure where our actual S-turn experiment is generating more force than the quasi-steady approach. So 
one thing that the quasi-steady approach misses is accounting for the effect of these vortices. So again, that where we see that is between t times four and one. So this is where the boat is rolled to windward. And then as a sailor to flatten and turn downwind again, you drive your knee into that corner of the cockpit there. And so what's happening, if we look back at those PIV results, at key time four, we're starting to generate this big clockwise vortex at the leech of the sail here. And then the important part is once that vortex is generated, the sailor is moving the sail right on top of it. So if you think about vortexes are basically spinning fluid, uh, a tornado is a version of a vortex that is just really big and powerful. And vortexes have a really low pressure in their center. So that's why tornadoes suck things up because there's a low pressure in the middle. So this vortex that we've got here in red has a low pressure and we're moving the sail right next to it. So we've generated this low pressure and now that's sucking our sail downwind harder than just the wind would normally. So I think that's really the takeaway here is that we can yeah, do better than just downwind sailing by creation and then positioning relative to these large vortices that are created during S turns. So how does that compare? Do we think we're actually capturing what happened on the water? Uh, so this plot, we're looking at two different things. So again, this is our driving force coefficient, which is similar to that downwind force coefficient that we were looking at. So this solid line is what we measured in the towing tank. And then the dotted line is on the water mast bend. So we had that masthead camera that was looking down at the boat. And by looking at how the hull moved in the frames of those videos, we can see how much the mast is bending back and forth, which should be related to how much force is in the sail at any point during the S turn. And so we see that our mast bend indicator matches fairly well to the forces that we're measuring in the towing tank. So I think that's a really good indication that, I mean, we simplified the problem to only look at this fundamental 2D uh, picture of it, but we're still capturing the primary things that are happening uh, because where these two lines are matching pretty well. Uh, so that wraps up uh, the S turning portion. And I'm not sure if Justine has uh, any questions from YouTube there. Hey, Justine, are the, were there any uh, questions on the S turning couple, stuff? Yeah, we have a couple questions that came in. Um, one came in is, how do you remove the forces generated by the foils from the simulation when comparing tank data? So can you remove the forces generated, generated, by, the foils? generated by the foils from the simulation when comparing tank yeah. data? Yeah, so I think one thing to take away is we actually haven't run any simulations here yet. They're all actual experiments. So we're measuring forces in the tank. And so maybe this goes back to when I was talking about the inertial forces where we were running the same experiment in the air. And so that gives us the force just from the mass of that foil when we move back and forth, you're accelerating that little 2D foil back and forth. So that's gonna register on your force uh, balance. And we then run the same experiment in the water. And so that basically is giving us the aerodynamic plus the inertial forces. We were also measuring just the inertial forces. So if we subtract those two, we can get just the hydrodynamic forces. Awesome. And then there's a lot of other comments. Good stuff, Rad. This is mind blowing. Oh. Um, you let the cat out of the bag, Riley. So <laughs> great. Um, another good one came in is any computational simulations. At least one of the company logos on the first screen has software capable, capable of running such analysis. Yeah. So I think that we have Siemens and Nimbix uh, as new partners for the team. And we didn't have those capabilities when I was running this uh, investigation at Cornell. But I think that is 
a, those tools that Siemens and Nimbix offer to run simulations would be a great way to extend this research. Um, so now that we've shown that it works in 2D, running a 3D experiment in our towing tank setup would be pretty hard. But I think the Star CCM Plus, which is the software from Siemens, would be really useful for looking at more of the whole 3D picture and trying to put that together. Yeah, awesome. And continuing studies. So really cool stuff coming. Yeah. I'll let you um, get on to the second part of the presentation. But just a reminder for everyone, um, if you do have any questions for Riley, you can put them into the chat and I'll be sure to ask them um, at the end. Yeah. All right. So now we'll move into roll tacking. So that second kinetic technique that we're going to go through. And so this research started uh, with some testing on the water in Miami, Florida with Sarah Lehan. Um, so here's a video clip where we watch her do three different tacks. Um, I think the really cool part about these tacks is how identical they are. So there are three separate tacks. And if we watch them again, I've actually flipped this video on the right here. So that is a tack from port to starboard rather than starboard to port. But her body motion still looks incredibly similar. And it's really important to have really good sailors doing our sailing for us in these tests so that we can be confident that the techniques that we're capturing and these motion profiles that we're measuring are what actually works in races. So the dynamics of roll tacking. Now, I'm sure most of you are really good at roll tacking um, and or at least definitely know what it is. But to explain here, we're going from one tack to the other. And so first, the sailor's pointing to go head to wind. And then, in this case, Sarah's delaying her body weight shift so that the boat can heel way over. And then she jumps to the new side of the boat, and the boat flattens and starts sailing on the other tack. So this can be used to improve your maneuvering speed in both light and moderate wind. And the cool thing is, it can actually improve your overall average speed up the course in light wind. So that's why it's, the technique is limited by rule 42, because if you just roll tacked all the way up the course in light wind, you would go way faster than if you were just sailing without doing so many roll tacks. So again, our question isn't looking at whether it should be legal or not, but what's actually happening during a roll tack that makes it work. So to do that, we wanted to have sort of a control um, in our experiments. So we had two testing conditions, really light wind, uh, and then a nice moderate 11 knots. And we did two kinds of attacks. So this is Dan here sailing for us uh, on Cuba Lake. And here's a roll tack where he heels almost over to 60 degrees and then flattens. And then we had him do what we called a flat tack, which is actually hard to get good sailors to do a flat tack because it's really not what you should be doing. But we asked him to keep the boat as level as possible during a tack so that we can use that as our comparison. So say, okay, if we look at a roll tack, how much better is that than if you did not roll tack and you did one of these flat tacks? And so here we'll look at a series of plots where at the top we have our light wind condition the roll tack is the solid line, the flat tack is the dotted line. And in the bottom, we've got our moderate wind. So here we're looking at boat heading. So how quickly is that turning through the wind? And we go from 15 seconds before the tack, or we're saying time zero is head to wind, to 15 seconds afterwards. And so unsurprisingly, we see that in light wind, the, mo the heading shift is slower than it is in moderate wind. But it gets interesting when we start looking at keel, right? So here we saw Dan let the boat keel way over. And we see that that yeah, goes up to right around 60 degrees for the roll tack in light wind. In moderate wind, he wasn't letting the boat keel over quite as much, uh, but still way more than the flat tack. And we see that it's a gradual increase in heel angle, and then the flatten is pretty quick. So how does this affect the speed? Uh, so here we're looking at speed over ground from our GPS in moderate wind and light wind. 
I think the real takeaway to watch here as a sailor is if you're not doing a good tack or you're not doing a roll tack, afterwards, these flat tacks, even 15 seconds afterwards, you still haven't recovered to your velocity or your boat speed that you had going into the tack. Where your roll tack in moderate wind, you're coming back up to your entry velocity pretty quickly. And in light wind, here we're actually having a speed that's a little bit faster than the speed going into the tack, which probably is against rule 42, where you can't exit faster than you went in. Um, but a couple tenths of a knot you might get away with. So again, what we're really interested in here is VMG, how that boat speed converts to distance going up the course. And so here we plot our velocity made good from the light wind roll tack and flat tack and the moderate wind roll tack and flat tack. So if we look at our velocity made good in the direction of the wind, the area under this curve is how much distance you've traveled up the course. And so anything where we're above your average velocity going in, which is the gray line here, all of these shaded green areas is where you've gained relative to somebody who didn't tack. So we see in all the cases, as you start turning into the wind, you're carrying your momentum in a better direction, which is momentarily giving you an advantage. Unfortunately, in all the cases, there's a part where your VMG is lower than it would have been if you didn't tack. But the interesting part comes when you add all of these up, we can see the roll tack and light wind, you're actually gaining uh, almost a boat length relative to somebody who didn't tack. Um, and it's largely because, and certainly compared to somebody who flat tacked, because in a flat tack, you're losing a lot. And the case is true in moderate wind also, where the flat tack, you're losing a lot more than you would in a roll tack. If we look at how this lines up, so we've got our ladder rungs here on our race course. On the left-hand side, we've got our roll tack and light wind. And on the right-hand side, our flat tack. These two boats go. And so these images are actually taken. They're constructed from data that we collected on the water. Um, and we see at the end of just one tack, we've got almost a boat length of VMG distance that the roll tack uh, gained an advantage over the flat tack. So all that is largely what we would expect because we know that roll tacking works. And now to investigate what's actually happening, we're gonna do our 2D section analysis again, looking at draft strike number two during the roll tack. So if we look at driving force coefficient, which so this is the force coefficient in the direction of the bow, how much your sail is pushing you forward. We can see a huge spike in this driving force coefficient, and this is from towing tank tests. So here we're going and doing that towing tank test, and we see that in that flattened stage, you're just your driving force coefficient is really going up. When the flat tack it's actually negative for a lot of the time, which means that in the flat tack, your sail's pushing you backwards, um, basically any of the time that it's not creating enough lift to drive you forwards. It's a little less pronounced in moderate wind, which we saw that difference in the performance of the boat also, but you still see that you get a nice boost in driving force coefficient uh, in the roll tack. So if we go and look at our particle image voila symmetry uh, measurements, here we're going to watch what happens in the flat tack and light wind. And we can see a really cool Carmen Vortex street develop behind the sail. But generally, the streamlines look how you would expect for streamlines around our airfoil. We'll watch it again. So this is that 2D section, how it moves through the air during a flat tack and things are pretty well behaved. If we then move to our roll tack, 
we can see the sail come, and this is where the sailor flattens. And we see these giant vortices created here, and they're created in a pair. And they move downwind as the boat moves off upwind. So we'll just watch that one more time. So we come up, it's after the tack, this is the flatten, and this large vortex pair gets created. And if you think about that vortex pair that's moving downwind, that actually equates to a fair amount of fluid that's in those two vortices, and they're propelling each other downwind with quite a bit of momentum. And from a force momentum balance, if they're getting pushed downwind, it means that the sail had to be pushed upwind harder than it would have been if you didn't roll tack. And so that's why we saw that giant spike in driving force is because of the creation of this vortex pair. So I think we'll leave it there for today where we saw yeah, the S curves and the vortices created in those and then those giant, that giant vortex pair created in the roll tack. So I'd like to obviously thank a bunch of the other researchers and sailors that worked on this. I certainly couldn't have done it by myself. Uh, the team that we had at Cornell and then all of our uh, visiting sailors and some visiting researchers really made it happen. So thanks to all of them. And then yeah, thanks to the Starboard Portal for letting me talk about it for an hour. So I'll go back to Justine if there's any more questions. And I'll... Yeah, awesome, Riley. Fascinating stuff. Um, a couple questions from the audience. Um, how are you accounting for the change in sail shape during the tack in the tow test? Yeah, so again, we did some uh, experiments on sail flicking where we did look at flexibility and how the leech was moving. Um, but really we were looking at the fundamental 2D uh, things going on. And so in this case, we had a fairly rigid uh, 3D printed section. Um, so I think that that definitely is a, an area that we need to continue uh, the research to look at the nuances of how your sail trim affects it. Also look at things like how the speed that you're flattening. Um, so do you take one second to bring the boat flat or do you take two seconds to do it? Uh, so looking at those details are definitely important but not something that we've done in this first round of testing. Great. Um... Another one was uh, wondering if there's any research uh, similar to this on skiffs. Yeah, so I'm not aware of any in skiffs. Um, I think the skiff case is really interesting because it brings in a lot of spinnaker dynamics too, which we did some work with Mike Ingham a few years ago on flow visualization around asymmetric and symmetric spinnakers at different points of sail and how you get attached flow and what the streamlines there look like. And I think in the skiffs, it would be really, yeah, I mean, we obviously have some really good skiff sailors on the team and I'd love to spend some time digging into that. Yeah, awesome. And with some great IR&D partners behind us, it's making it possible to yeah. do that research directly with the team. Um, another one, uh, just focusing on the laser for this research, how do you anticipate um, it, much changes due to the multi-sale configuration if you were to run uh, the same type of research? Yeah, I'm not sure. We'd really have to, uh, yeah, we'll have to table that question and think about it some more. Yeah, I'm sure it would be complex. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, another, uh, just a comment was, it would be interesting to see a similar analysis on body torquing. Um, what makes it work so well? Yeah, so I think that's, a really interesting one. Um, that also comes a lot into how it's interacting with the water and the waves. Um, yeah, and I so I think the the research that they're doing at Cornell right now, I think that they've moved on to uh, roll jibes, which will also be fascinating because there's obviously a lot of complex flow separation going there. And I think body torquing would be a great one to add to their list. And I know they're always open to uh, new student researchers too. So if there's anybody who wants to get their hands dirty doing some of this stuff, um, we can always use help the IR&D department if you wanna yeah, do some engineering for us. And I know Cornell is looking for students to pursue their research also. Awesome, so research at Cornell is live, active and accepting new students. Sounds yep. Like. No, as soon as they're, I mean, right now, obviously everybody's at home and they're not uh, out doing experiments, but 
hopefully by the summer when sailing's good in Ithaca, they'll be back out there collecting more data. Excellent. Um, and then from kind of this research, is there, do you have any suggestions on changes to the downwind technique that's being practiced by many sailors today? So I don't, our, I guess to start out with, we intentionally didn't want to tell sailors how they should sail. Um, we were really wanting to look at the explanation for the mechanism, I mean, that, which I think will inherently help people sail better if they know what's going on. So I mean, for me, I, the first time I tried to drive a standard car, I was having a terrible time when I was 16 and could barely get out of the driveway. And then I went and read about like how transmission actually works and it made a lot more sense to me and then I could just do it. And so I think not everybody works that way, but for people who really wanna know the physics of what's going on, I think this just knowing that you're creating these vortices and thinking about how that can help you sail faster is a, yeah, good. But I can't say like you should be rocking a little more or less. Yeah, it, it puts the science behind the those uh, total feel sailors out there. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was interesting. So I was on a call with Dave Perry while he was talking about some rule stuff uh, a couple weeks ago. And he said, yeah, the physics, I just go more on feel and patterns. And then he goes into all these details about rules and he's like diving into the nitty gritty of it. But he says like on the aerodynamics point of view, he's happy to leave that to other people. And I guess I'm the opposite. I really want to know how the aerodynamics works. And then the rules, definitely I'm happy to leave that to other people. Yeah, awesome. Glad to have both of you behind our team. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one question was, uh, what conclusion surprised you most if there were any surprises? So. I guess on the S turns, that was when we started out doing those experiments, we were looking, we sort of figured we, well, we wanted to do roll tacking experiments upwind, but then we had these big downwinds that we had to do also. So we said, oh, Robbie, can you just sail downwind as whatever you think will be the fastest? And he started doing me as S turns. And then we started looking at the motion there. And so it was pretty fascinating to say that we didn't have any preconceived notions about what we would find. And then this vortex pattern where we have the sail creating these vortices that then stay there and the sail moves in front of them that just, that we have this coherent vortex pattern that popped out even though presumably the sailors weren't saying, okay, I wanna create a vortex and move on top of it. But that's the way that it happens when you look at the uh, reduced frequencies of the sail motion. Awesome. Um, so I think these two questions can kind of be teed up together. So um, we have a guest one wondering what division you studied with at Cornell. Um, and then the another one wondering about if this type of testing could be done on keelboats 20 to 30 feet and if there's any interest. So yeah, so I was in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department uh, there, which it's combined. So my degree was in aerospace. Um, but I think that, yeah, mechanical and aerospace engineering um, and then even now that computer science with simulation are all ways that you can contribute to these projects. We had a couple of computer science students uh, working on this with us. And yeah, and then the other one was about keelboats. I think that there definitely is room for uh, some keelboat investigation. I mean, we were looking for ways that we could go out on the water and do a bunch of testing, which was obviously easier with a laser that we could pull up on shore and handle with a university budget, but I think some keelboat partners would be, yeah, a really interesting way to drive this research forward. Awesome. Um, so just to tee off on your education background, just a little bit um, for the audience, kind of what your education background is. Was a Yeah, so I, guess it was, I did aerospace engineering at MIT and then also aerospace engineering at Cornell, um, although I had a gap in the middle there where I worked, worked for a bunch of professional sailing teams uh, doing yeah, CFD or computational fluid dynamics simulations for primarily hull and appendage design. Um, but I think, yeah, I've known for, as my mom would say, since I was like six years old that I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer before I really even knew that was, and I've mm -hmm. stuck to it. But I think, yeah, anything in the STEM fields can really be valuable to this kind of research. 
Awesome. Um, and then just, I think our final question, unless one pops up here, but uh, what inspired you to become part of the US sailing team and focus on Olympics um, as opposed to continuing work with the America's Cup and the, the larger boat scene? Yeah, so it was interesting because I guess in the beginning of the last cup cycle or at the end of the last cup cycle, that coincided with the uh, yeah hiring for the Olympic team. So I was being pursued by a cup team and the Olympic team. And uh, really, I think the opportunity to work with the sailors, like be down in Miami, out on the water with the sailors, doing debriefs with them, and yeah, obviously helping the US win um, really was inspiring. And I think we've just got so many hardworking sailors that getting to interact with them a lot uh, is what ultimately sold me on it. Awesome. Um, and then a, another question did pop in. Uh, how about Vang Dynamics and the shape of the draft stripe? Yeah, so we, I guess that wasn't one of the questions that we dug into, but certainly, um, I guess here we sort of controlled for it by telling the sailors to sail where they thought was appropriate. So we're relying on their judgment to pick the best Vang settings and then the result of that is the draft stripe that we got. So we measured that. We didn't go and say, okay, we want this to be a variable in our experiments. Um, so I guess the answer is that we don't have any conclusions about that other than to say that, yeah, we're relying on the judgment of our sailors to give us what they think is the best for those conditions. Awesome. And we do have one more and it's a good one. Is there a future for wingtip winglets? Yeah, so they're, I mean, they work, right? That's why they're on a lot of different things. Um, if we look at, so this came up in the 2013 cup when we had limits on our rudder horizontals and we're not generating enough lift, but we couldn't make the span longer. So we put little winglets on there and it improved performance of the boat quite a bit. Um, so, and, I think that yes, in their place, they're important. Um, do I think we're going to have them on the top of masts uh, regularly? Probably not. Awesome. Well, so those that's all the questions. Um, so I want to just thank you, Riley, and everyone for listening and our partners, Seaman and Nimbix, who support uh, Riley's efforts in the studies with our, our current Olympic team. Um, if you enjoyed today's session, we encourage you to tune in and follow the, a variety of the sailing content featured um, for our community. Please support our efforts to build this community of active and engaged sailors by purchasing or renewing a US sailing membership. We have a lot of great content coming up in the, in the schedule. Thanks to US sailing members, we are able to adapt and evolve to better serve sailors with content like this. Visit us at ussailing.org slash membership to join or renew US sailing today. Again, thanks for joining us and thank you, Riley. Um, for the presentation. Yeah, thanks to everybody. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about this stuff. Hopefully we can do it again. Yeah, no, hope to have you up on here because this is fascinating. So thank you. Great.